five and a half years ago, around the time of the financial crisis, I started looking into banking, and I fell in a rabbit hole. Like in Alice in Wonderland, you know, where things are curiouser and curiouser, like that. At first I thought, maybe I'm missing something, maybe I'm not understanding. Then I thought, it's just a big misunderstanding. We're going to talk it over, we're going to figure it out. And then the plot thickened. Let me take you to the rabbit hole of banking. First, we have to talk a little bit about debt and leverage. Here's Kate. She has a $400,000 house and $380,000 in mortgage debt. Her equity part is $20,000, about 5% of the value of the house. Now, think of this as her investment. What happens if the value of the house goes up by a little bit, just 2.5%? Ah, nice. She made $10,000 on her $20,000 of investment. Nice return, huh? What if the house goes up by just 5%? Ah, oh, she doubled her investment. How wonderful. It worked for her. And if the house goes up by just 10%, she tripled her investment of $20,000 up to $60,000. All this profit is hers. That's what happens when you use a lot of debt. It magnifies, it gives you leverage, and that's really great on the upside. But there is a catch. What if the house goes down in value by just a little bit, just 2.5%? Ooh, now she lost half of her equity. And should the house go down by 5%, her equity is wiped out. If it continues downward, the house goes down by 10% from the start. She's what's called underwater. She owes more on her house than the house is worth. So that's how it can happen. Now let's talk about banks. How do banks get money to invest? Their first source is all of us. We lend them money in deposits. We sometimes forget that, but that's their debt. They owe us back that money. In fact, we expect this money to be paid anytime we want. Go to the ATM or the bank, it's supposed to be there. How else do banks get money? Oh, they find many, many, many ways to borrow, to make promises to pay back and get money in exchange. From money market funds, from each other, from bond investors, they get a lot of money by way of taking on debt. But they don't put it under the mattress, do they? We want them to lend, they want to invest, they want to take risk. And what happens if they lose? How can they pay all that debt? Better have some money from their shareholders and owners, some equity. Say 5% like Kate had in the beginning. But the banks all invest in the same things. And in fact, they are very tied up by investing in one another. And so here's what can happen when the bank loses money. Here's what did happen when banks lost money. Watch it. They all tend to fail at the same time and take each other down with them. And uh-oh, we cannot have this system fail. So let's prop it up. Let's use taxpayer money. Is Uncle Sam saving the banking system, bailing out using taxpayer money? That's what happened. Now let's ask, how do other companies get their money to invest? <laughs> There's a little bit of a different pattern of colors. You know of Google. Here's how Google gets money to invest. Most of the money they get is from their shareholders and owners. They take their profits, reinvest them, unborrowed money that can be used to take risk. No problem. What about other companies? Average Corp USA has 70% equity, some debt, some companies borrow more than others, but importantly, almost no healthy company unless it's on its way to bankruptcy, maintains on a regular basis less than 30% equity. And if they did, if they became heavily indebted, all kinds of things would start happening. Their lenders are going to charge them large interest, they're going to put all kinds of conditions on them. The banks are very good at putting tough conditions on indebted borrowers, we know that. So why are the banks so different? Why are they so different? I'll give you the answer, because it works for them, basically. The more reckless they are in that particular way, the more actually subsidies, subsidies they get, bonuses they get, the upside is wonderful. And the downside is not so bad for them. That's why they're different, really. So, of course, they have very flawed incentives to take on risk and too much debt. And we got to counter that. In fact, we know we have a financial crisis and uh, lots of people got harmed from that. 
So we were promised there were going to be tough regulations. Tough regulations. And what did we get? Here's what we got. In Basel, in Switzerland, 27 countries negotiated the tough new reforms called Basel III. They agreed that banks should have at least 3%, 3% equity, the green stuff, relative to the total. 3%. In the U.S., they went tough on the t large banks, tough. 5%, like Kate had. 5% of the total investments has to be funded with equity and not debt. If there are insured deposits involved, 6%. Remember, no company that is living, large company, has access to its own profits, to equity, lives on less than 30% equity. And when they fail, they don't take down the economy with them. And the banks, the ones that harm, are able to live like that. And if you want to take another stock of what's going on, here are the largest banks in the world, those too-big-to-fail banks. These are the top 28 banks in the universe uh, by the size of their assets, by the flag of where they come from. This was 2006, two years before the financial crisis. And we had a crisis since then, and supposedly tough reforms. And where are they today? Bigger. Average size in 2006 was $1.3 trillion. Average size today, $1.7 trillion. There are no such corporations in the world. No corporations is as big as these monstrous institutions. They are big. And, importantly, by every measure, incredibly knotted up. In ways we don't even see, in markets we don't even see very well. All kinds of markets in which they interact with one another, such that, once again, a small loss can take a chain reaction and take an entire economy down. So what's going on? I started by saying something about Alice in Wonderland and a rabbit hole. But the story that really fits is the Emperor's New Clothes story. That's a wonderful tale. In this tale, these self-declared tailors tell the emperor that uh, they make very special clothes, beautiful and very unique in that they can only be seen by people who are smart enough, competent enough. If you can't see them, you must be stupid or unfit for your job. And the emperor buys the clothes and gives them lots of money and lots of fabrics, which they put away, and then they pretend to sew the clothes, the clothes and the ministers and the emperor just adore those clothes. And the emperor then goes on a parade in the street with these new clothes. And everybody admires the clothes except for the little boy who says, hey, the emperor is naked. In banking, there are lots of people who say lots of things. The bankers say lots of things. The policymakers, regulators, politicians say lots of things. A lot of banking experts say lots of things. Academics say lots of things. And a disturbing proportion of what they say has as much substance as the emperor's new clothes. Let me give you just a couple of examples, just a glimpse. You might read in the newspapers, US banks are forced to hold $68 billion in extra capital. Here's how it starts. Let's use a really confusing language that nobody can understand. Hold capital, now what does that mean? Well, in banking, hold capital means use equity funding, onboard money. But hold capital, it sounds like a pile of cash that you don't use, hold 68 billion. That's the Financial Times headline. A paper trying to be a little friendlier to the readers, because maybe most people actually don't understand what this word capital means in banking, replaces the same headline with the word cash. Now, there's a word we understand. U.S. banks forced to hold $68 billion in cash. Now, that sounds tough, but it sounds like it's a pile of cash they were told to set aside somehow and not use. Guess what? This is just false. False. This is not what this is about. This particular headline refers to the requirement that banks have 5% equity to the total. Nobody's telling the banks what to do with their money. This is just telling them to use onboard money to invest equity funding. But this confusion that's pervasive and insidious is very convenient for the bank lobbyist. Because the bank lobbyist is going to say, every dollar in capital is a dollar not put in the economy. Don't increase those capital requirements, whatever they are, 
because the economy will suffer and we won't land and growth will suffer and recovery will suffer, scares the politicians who have no idea what this is really about or maybe don't want to know. This is nonsense, total nonsense. So people might not understand what it's saying, but it's false. And it goes on from there. A whole wardrobe of these things that they say. All the way to just the spin. The spin is, there was panic in 2008. It was like a natural disaster. And we rushed to the scenes, and we helped, and we propped up this system, and we did it just for you. And it would have been worse otherwise. Let's focus on that. And we, now we need to recover. We're doing everything to recover. We're doing it just for you. This way, we don't have to discuss how the awful regulations that they had before the crisis that allowed all this risk to build up were flawed, and how they're failing with the new regulations since. So, what's going on here, and how you can see that they're all kind of lying to you, is the following. Here's your disconnect. The banks are saying, oh, if you put these capital requirements on us, we can't lend. Remember, the capital requirements are just about how much green versus red they have on their, in their building. But here, when they make money, which most companies use as a great source of investment funding, they rush to pay it back out. Here's money they could have lent and satisfied the capital requirements just fine. Instead, they pay it out so that they can borrow and live on the edge a little bit more. So that's after they complain that they can't lend, and they could have perfectly well used their profits instead of paying them out. And the regulators? The regulators have perfect authority to say, you know, why don't you keep that green money? Just do anything but pay it out. Build up your green, the p green part of your, of your building of your balance sheet, so that you're safer, so that you can keep investing and protect your creditors and invest on behalf of your shareholders like other companies. So, among the most no-brainer bargains in financial reform that we just totally messed up is the idea that instead of 5%, banks should have what's minimal, 20 to 30%. Everything you can think about, about the safer bank, is better, except for very few people who prefer the riskier bank. Everything is better. They can do everything. They can make the loans. They can make them more consistently, take the past, everything. But yet, we're not getting it. So what's going on? How is the plot thickening? Well, it's about what people know, but it's also about what people want to know. On this, Upton Sinclair said the following, you can't teach a man something if his salary depends on not understanding it. So, there's what's called willful blindness. You might not understand, but you might not want to understand. I got my story, I'm sticking to it. You can make lots of variations on this particular sentence. For example, could you get a politician to engage or to understand something if they got campaign contributions on the line? Could you get a regulator to engage if they got all kinds of incentives to avoid engaging, really, or to avoid challenging the banker? Can you get even a reporter or a journalist to challenge a policymaker or a banker or anybody expert if they need a story from these people, if they need the phone call return? Everybody's got their issue about challenging. So, just like in the emperor's new clothes, do you challenge the emperor, do you challenge the ministers, or do you play along? Do you say, oh, little boy, you don't see those beautiful clothes when you grow up. You're going to see the, little clo the, the beautiful clothes of the emperor. How do you handle that situation? The real politics comes from this statement by Senator Richard Durbin from 2009, right after the financial crisis. Banks are still the biggest lobby in Washington, and they frankly own the place. So in other countries, too, there is often a symbiosis between banks and governments, between bankers and politicians, and there's where the plot gets thick. So now, here we are. We might only pay attention to the financial system in a major crisis, so we're dealing with other things. Meanwhile, we have a really bad system, reckless system, out of control, very dangerous, not much has changed. Can we have a better system? We can, but unfortunately, if you leave it to the people doing it right now, it doesn't seem like 
it's going to happen. So we can have a better system, but we must demand a better system. And that's why I need you to help me scream. Thank you.